Well, and, every decision well, then, you make affects your headroom, well, and you need and to be every, cognizant of that. Well, every every piece of gear has yeah. its has its own headroom, has its limit. So, like a mic, you can distort a mic at the capsule or at the yeah. Yeah. the transducer. You're listening to the GWNL podcast. Guys with no lives talking about audio. Hi, and welcome to episode five with Guys With No Lives podcast. I almost called it PowerPoint. That's embarrassing. That's not what we do at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> my name is Joe. We have Ben and Brian again, because that's all three of us. That's the whole crew. Sadly, I wish they were just guest artists, but I have to deal with them every week. Every week. We are the guys with no lives. Hey. So we're here every week, right? Sadly, every week, <laughs> in spite of my, in spite of what I want. Um. So today we're talking about mix down and headroom there are a lot of different things involved with that a lot of it kind of comes with gain staging a lot of it comes with balance balance is a big part of what we do as audio engineers let's start with bryant bryant why don't you start us off with uh your thoughts mix down headroom ready set go mix down headroom it's pretty simple you know you're you're essentially summing or compiling multiple tracks into a single, either a single track or a, or a stereo track or multiple stereo tracks, stems, and then doing some sort of processing if it's needed. And then down, then you're summing that down again to like your left, right stereo. And then that's what you print and you send out to your mastering engineer. Or if you mastered it, then you put it on the internet and distribute it. As far as headroom goes, headroom is just the amount of space that you have left until you have some sort of distortion. So it's like your, I don't know, your headroom. (laughs) No, no, no. Your headroom is like, that's the space that (laughs) you have to work with. I mean, ultimately, like I know for a live sound engineer, like headroom is important. Like if I don't have enough headroom, then I can't make something louder. And that comes down to two things for me as an engineer, like do I have enough speakers to give myself the actual volume to, to, you know, to, so that the audience can hear and it comes down to signal strength as well. I mean, there's a reason why we talk about mixing at unity rather than at like negative 16 or negative eight. I talked about in like episode one about how gain is resolution. That gain still affects your headroom having proper resolution of the sound signal that's coming. And I use the term resolution knowingly. Like I don't, that's not a joke. That's not a, Oh, I I do broadcast. I don't do broadcast. It's that when we think about the dynamic contrast and headroom that matters and having your signal strength at the proper ratio or the proper space matters a lot. You can solve a lot of problems, especially in live sound from having good gain staging and good levels on your meters. And a lot of people don't do that. They, they yeah, rush definitely. themselves through sound check and that's the biggest sin you can do to yourself. The biggest sin. Yeah. So, yes. I mean, I think yeah. Yeah, overall it is like, it is about balance and it is about gain staging, which we talked a lot about before, like, but it's all the gain staging at the final stage, you know, which deals with your headroom and your mix down. And that headroom really is just like, there's a tippy top of the signal, you know, and if you, the wave is going up and down, if it hits the top, it squares off and that causes that distortion, you know, with, with modern digital stuff, it squares off. The reason why a lot of analog gear is considered desirable or analog gear in, in general, not even older analog gear is because when it hits the top, it doesn't just chop it off like a digital signal would do or like a digital like version of some compressors. Now we have like modern plugins, which will smooth that off. But ultimately, it's the same thing we talked about in compression, where with analog equipment, it will smooth that rather than it becoming like a square wave ish type to your waveform or transient. Yeah, yeah. but and when it hits that, I mean, we talked about distortion in the last episode, too. Right. Um, but when it hits that, it's just you can't go any further. And it really is called headroom because the example I use too is like literally a ceiling. So, you know, I'm like six foot two. If I was in a room that was six foot tall, I have no headroom, you know, and I got to like squat down. If I try to stand up all the way, I will literally hit my head. But if I have a, a room that's seven feet tall, you know, if I could actually jump any high anymore, I could maybe hit my head there. But if it's eight feet tall, there's no way I can jump high enough to hit my head on that ceiling. And so I can jump around all I want and not have to worry about that. So if you think about audio as a bunch of people jumping around in the room and the signals bouncing around. Jump up and jump around. Yeah. 
Yeah. We have to have enough room for their heads to bump up and down because that's what's happening. Our none of our signals, except for some like sine base or something like that, is going to just be this constant level. It's like jumping up and down, and so that headroom's to have enough room so that even if your mix is jumping up and down, it doesn't clip and peak and distort and hit. That. I one hundred percent was watching yeah. that this week as I was doing speaker diagnostics at work. As I was jumping around. No. No, no, seeing like how oh, the amperage and the wattage the video of for the jump around. No, no. Gosh. <laughs> what do you think I'd do at work? I don't Just, know. Like, I really videos don't know. About, like, <laughs> speaker diagnostics. I, I test speakers um, to make sure they're not working. No, but like even the amperage and the wattage and the power consumption changes yeah. moment to moment. And if you like, sometimes yeah. you want to meter that at like a RMS kind of a thing where it like averages things out. And sometimes you want to meter others. Anyways, headroom. Yeah. It's important to like be able to handle those peaks and stuff. It's just like, I see that. I see how it like things are constantly moving and it's not a same like power consumption or the same signal at all. Well, that's, that's the, sound. there's the, sorry, there, there's like different things yeah. you can look at as far as headroom goes. Like you have your, you have your headroom in the digital world, you know, or like on a mixer before it's going out to amps or something and you have that threshold but then you also have you know the threshold on your amps um if you're in like the live sound world going from your amp to your speaker you need to make sure that you know your your amps have enough headroom to be able to push your speakers without pushing them too far so you don't damage your speakers right and, and then, in a power consumption and in yeah. a volume yeah. and and that's a cool thing joe is that everything like every system has like meters and it has like headroom and it has like both on power. Yes. Yeah. About both on power yeah. and that. And, and the other thing that we haven't talked about as we talked about mixing is, you know, with our gain staging is like between plugins. That's a big thing that people don't realize. If you, if you push one plug into the output of one plug in too hard, you could distort the input of the next plugin and it might not even show you. That is also, just, like when you do multiple yeah. stages of compression, you may not increase the gain, but the saturation and, and other aspects of the, again, you're changing that signal and you have to be cognizant of how that changes the sound. I mean, I very much believe in psychoacoustics. That's an important thing to realize. And it kind of delves into that a little bit. I'm but glad like, you that's, believe in a truth. Do you, do you believe in psychoacoustics? <laughs> But like, no, like, I, I agree, like, totally, like, understanding, like, all of those things and how it changes the sound signal, that's, like, your job. Like, that's why, as, like, audio engineers and, like, technicians, we need to know how that changes both saturation, both input and output gain, and how we control those things. That's, like, yeah. the point. Now, no one's going to ever perfectly understand that except for, you know, some famous people, but whatever. <laughs> well, and that's moving on to another point is that, this is one thing that really gets mixed up with um, there's a lot of novices is 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 knowing about your headroom. And like a lot of people will give really detailed things about, oh, well, your bass, need, your, your kick needs to hit it negative six or whatever. Right. Um, but the, the general idea is that you need to have headroom. Those those meters are not clipping. And like my thing that I always point out is the, the master fader. Most DAWs have a master fader set up. And the big mistake I see people make all the time is when they mix too hot and it's like hitting red on the master fader. And, and what do they do? The master they fader slide down. the master fader down. And it's like, that's, there's a lot of DAWs actually cheat for you and like either put a limiter on that master fader. So when it's hitting red, it's not really clipping, but it's limiting it. And so you're like doing some mastering there, unbeknownst to the person, you know, yeah. and other ones will actually, when you bring the master fader down, it actually like acts like a DCA and turns the output of all the tracks down. And so it gets rid of that clipping. But the real solution, and I always tell, you know, my students, I'm like, don't touch the master fader, leave it at zero. And you got to bring yeah. your whole mix down. You know, that's the solution. And so as you're mixing, you're constantly looking at your metering output to make sure as you're doing stuff that you're not losing um, that headroom. You still have and, it. And, and it does come back to gain staging. As you're recording on the way in, you don't necessarily need to record at the absolute highest level until like, oh, my when I first got into recording, I was, you know, I was changing the gain. I was like really pumping the gain until I would start to clip and I'd be like, okay, now I'm too hot. And then I'd bring it down just a little bit from there. 
well, you don't necessarily need to be that loud. Like you definitely need a healthy signal in like a, a good amount of signal, but it doesn't need to be a step down from clipping. Yeah. There's like, plenty of time later in the processing to get that nice and loud. Yeah. And like you're, you'll get, you'll get the loudness, especially if you're doing like a dense mix. If you, if you treat every single track, like, Oh, I'm going to push this until I clip and then bring it down a little bit. You're going to run out of headroom before you even got any plugins on and you can, mm-hmm. right. you can fix that later. But if you just do that on the way in and you just do a healthy, healthy signal instead of overdriven signal, then you don't have to worry about your headroom as much. Yeah. I, I want to kind of bring up like a couple things. So as I was working on some mixes last week, um, which I sent off to Ben to have him listen to him, I, one of the things that I did is I actually picked up a metering plugin. It's a free one. It's called Voxengo Spam. I mean, it's free. Like if you have nothing and no money, get this. It's, it's great for free. Like it's, it's fantastic. I can check out my DBFS and everything, but I, what I found myself doing quite often as I was mixing is as I noticed that I'd start to get to that point where I'm starting to peak, I would actually group, I would take the all group in pro tools. Cause I use pro tools for my studio work. Um, I grab that and I would bring it down by like three DB, like <laughs> everything. And then I would return my master back to zero and see if I'm still clipping and once I had a metering plugin, I didn't have to do that as often. And and I also like again taking Ben's advice. I had gotten a stepper uh, monitor controller, which is great. I love that because I know exactly where my volume is at on my monitors. And so like a lot of times for headroom, like as I was mixing to find my like to find balance, I found myself kind of adjusting the overall volume so that if I needed to hear it more in my studio, I would just adjust it on my monitor um, controller. And then I could still hear everything clearly and within a good DB rating. Cause I, I use a DB meter when I'm mixing in my, in my office. I don't want to have neighbors and two, I, I just want to know. So I don't blow my ears out. Cause it's really easy to yeah. lose your ears. And so like, that was something I realized last week. And that was like the first thing I kind of want to talk about is like being able to control and be able to hear these things at a proper volume, but still being able to have like the right metering and making sure that you're not peaking and you have plenty of headroom is super essential. And, and then I want to go into a second thing, which I run into. And like, we were talking, we've talked about the main pieces and parts, equalization and compression. When you're boosting things, in equalization, you have to remember you're boosting that. You are increasing the volume or the gain of that part of the signal, and it can cause your compressors to trigger off of that, which can affect your saturation, and and all these things can affect how you perceive the sound and can cause you to turn things up and up and up. And um, and so you have to, like, like going back to that whole plug-in thing, your output gain, your output sound, all of those things really matter when you're going from the beginning to the end and not every engineer is going to have access to their, to record their tracks. Sometimes like I know a lot of people will like record their own trumpet solo for like this thing or their own trumpet part for like a pop tune and then send it to the engineer. Now the engineer is stuck basically kind of having to pick up the pieces um, of all these different tracks and, and turn it into a cohesive mix. And so sometimes that's out of your control. I, I will admit to that. Yeah, some, ideally is, yeah. not, but that's well, that's one you, of those things. What were you yeah. talking about? I fell asleep there. Yes. Oh my gosh! <laughs> Get out! You're fired. I, I started this podcast and I'm kicking you out now. But yeah, if if you're if you're primarily just a a mixing engineer or you want to be and you you know, want other people to record the tracks and send them to you. You don't necessarily get that luxury of having well-recorded tracks all the time. Like right, right now I'm, I'm working on an EP for this client that I've been working for, for a little bit. And, um, they record all of their stuff on like a two channel, two channel interface. They have like two mics and it's just a bunch of overdubs that they record themselves in their apartment. And then they send to me. And yeah. it's like a hundred tracks that are like, they, they don't, they don't really know about, know much about gain staging. So that's part of my job as a mixer to go through and, um, Oof. you know, gain stage, like I have to fix the gain staging at first and then go through and fix. Yeah. Problems. Like messing with the clip gain. Yeah. You no. Know, and, and that kind of thing, you just, 
I just go in and it's like, oh, this is too loud. This is too soft. You get everything to that nice, healthy level, you know? I do yeah. not. I did want to say something about, you know, I wasn't actually sleeping, Joe, when you were talking. Um, but I did want to say something about something you said in there and you just kept going. I'm like, I want to talk about this part. No, like, you're not no. allowed to talk about <laughs> it. was towards the beginning. Um, but it was a good point, like talking about headroom and about, wait, you know. Wait. I made a good point. Point? Yeah, you actually did. Oh, um, <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> but like, it was like one of the issues that I think a lot of people run into when they're using their little two channel interfaces and such, and especially when they're using the built in interface, like in the computer is not being able to get it loud enough for their headphones and such. Maybe your headphone amp isn't very strong or maybe your speakers. And so that's part of the reason why everything runs so hot and that master fader in the, in the DAW. Right. And like everybody like uses that master fader as like a volume controller for their speakers. And it's like, it's not. And you have a volume control. It shouldn't be. I know that some circumstances yeah. do like create that problem because that's the only way for them to get it loud enough to really hear it. Um, which is why you got to make sure that your interface, you know, has enough gain on it or whatever. Or to, to get able- yourself like some type of a headphone amplifier. Those aren't hard to come by. They're not super expensive. Um, well, like there's a lot of options, like, and this, this kind of like brings out like the, I guess like purist in me, I'm I'm not like an audio purist at all, but this is like part of it, but having like dedicated pieces, instead of just having like an all in one unit, like an audio interface, having an audio interface is great. And it's great because it made audio recording accessible to everyone at an affordable cost. Like it's super affordable. The downfall is that you have one unit that's doing everything. Doing the yeah, everything. <laughs> it's the preamp, the preamp for the mic. It is the uh, the AD, AD conversion, DA conversion, DA conversion yeah. um, the monitor, it's controller. your your monitor controller. Yeah. And if you if you have like dedicated pieces for all those, you know, a dedicated monitor controller, dedicated headphone amp, dedicated AD DA converters, and dedicated preamps. Th- those, although they're really expensive there's there's a reason they're expensive there's high quality components in them versus just like um an integrated circuit that's doing everything Mm -hmm. right and and if you don't know that those things are all individual things or they can be individual things like its own preamp and its own converter like i was eyeballing a a adda converter it was ben that turned me on to this one i always blame you for this no is the is like a two (laughs) thousand dollar converter all it does is it converts analog to digital and digital back to analog. Yeah, and it's um, two channels. It's a thousand bucks per channel, right? Is it, a, it's is like, it a common green one? No, it's actually not. I'm, I'm actually thinking of a completely different um, product. There's plenty of products yeah, there's a lot. in that price range. Yeah, <laughs> right. No, yeah. Um, but all it did was convert signal. And, and it's mm-hmm. like, well, why would I want that? Why wouldn't I want preamps on it? Well, because it's really, really freaking good. And it's pristine and it's clean. And you're not introducing other other elements or artifacts or other things into it. And like, yeah. well, and every decision then, you make affects your headroom well, and you need and to be every, cognizant of that. Well, every, every piece of gear has its, has its own headroom, has its limit. So like a mic, you can distort a mic at the capsule or at the, yeah. Yeah. at the transdu the transducer. Yeah, you can distort a preamp you can distort you can distort converters converters have headroom and so that's also like kind of another reason why like you know, it's important that you get high quality stuff if you want to make you know higher quality higher quality recordings so that you can take full advantage of that full headroom and not worry about that whereas on like a smaller interface you know if you're getting a smaller interface you're probably not at the level where that's an important important to you though i mean the point here is not to like tell everybody that you need to spend two thousand dollars on your, a converter, yeah, you, at least your, a thousand yeah. on each preamp. And if you're not spending ten thousand dollars on your monitors, um, you probably <laughs> shouldn't even be listening. I'm kidding. <laughs> if you're wondering, I'm I'm joking. But yeah, I mean, it's funny because when you were explaining that, Bryant, I was like, oh my goodness, my signal flow right here. Every I have exactly that. I have a separate monitor controller, a separate headphone amp, a a pre, a compressor. And a, an interface that's that's function is the ADDA converter, but they're all separate. And I was like, oh my goodness, I've become a snob. I've got them all <laughs> separate. But and no, that's the point is that it's fine to use them all together, but there is a reason why there's a high-end equipment that is no, all separate. 
And there's problems that do happen when they're all lugged together too. And so, I mean, I think going back to my original point was that just to pay attention to what all the gain stages you have and that you do have a volume knob, an output knob, and your speakers have a volume knob. And if you feel, if you see yourself like reaching for that master fader and cranking it up to get everything louder, then you probably should look at how you can um, get some volume. Down. Yeah, or get some volume some other way. Like if you're like, I mean, I know there's some computers with built-in speakers where people are working on their projects and you know, working on your song and you, you crank up that master fader so you can get some volume out of the speakers that are built into the computer. Like that's not an ideal setup, you know? But if you have some studio monitors that you can buy, they have plenty of gain that you can actually, you know, crank up your little interface and, and get plenty of volume out of that so you don't have to be yeah. cranking that master fader. I, so. I think if we could sum up even all of that, like about gear and whatnot, it's not that we're telling you to spend a million dollars on gear or whatever, but you have to understand the limits of those gear. I think we've said that like a couple times, but yeah. like not like a Scarlet interface is not the best interface in the world. And that's okay. That it's great at what it does. And that's not a bad thing, but understand that that's not going to get you the same results as like a mix engineer in a hundred thousand dollar studio. I don't think anybody has that kind of expectation, but like, Sometimes you have to temper your expectations. Like again, like if you're mixing off a laptop and you only have laptop speakers, there's not much else you can do besides getting studio monitors or something else to kind of manage that. And and that's okay. Like understand those things. That's, that's well, and, it. and it really does come down to like your your material that you're working with. So like in, right. in music production, the most important part of your mix isn't actually the mix. The most important part of the mix is the song and the arrangement. If you have a good song, and then you have a good arrangement, it, it'll it mix itself, essentially, even if it right. was recorded on a Scarlett 2i2. Um, or like in like a podcast format, if you, have, if you have good source material, you're talking about good things, you will keep listeners engaged. I mean, you may not have the best audio quality, but as long as you have passable audio quality, you'll be fine. Just yeah. there's there's also speaking like, from kind experience. Of like, yeah, there's kind of <laughs> like the, the fine wine principle, though, with with audio. Um, or fine, fine cheese principle or <laughs> somebody that first tries like a certain kind of French cheese, the first time they try it, well, it's, it's different, you know, as, as you progress more in your palate, you'll be able to hear the differences more in the, the higher end stuff. And you're like, Oh my gosh, like I really want this. Like, or taste the differences. Or yeah, I, you'll be able to taste I the think differences. audio yeah. is more difficult to taste, to, to recognize those differences in quality than in like video because like it's really easy for somebody to say oh that picture looks sharper like i don't know why we as people perceive visually that way a little bit more effectively because like you look at video quality versus like audio quality and it wasn't until beats by dre that people really started paying for more expensive headphones commonly and and more expensive systems mm -hmm. it's kind of brought about a big hi-fi sort of revolution at least for headphones and whatnot um that's why a lot of people wear these headphones but yeah like like audio wise you don't really notice the glossiness of 96 kilohertz and 24 bit or 32 bit float and like 180 something i can't remember the stupid kill i i, I work at 96k one, is the highest 192 192k Whatever, some stupid K. dumb thing that's like really high. I don't care. I mix it ninety six <laughs> really k. Some well, um, no, yeah. but like, well, the, I think the yeah. I think that com comes down to, and this is kind of off topic, but that comes down to the limit of the range of human hearing. We're limited to twenty hertz to twenty kilohertz, and most of us, if like if, if 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 you're if you're over like the age of eighteen, you probably can't hear over, um, over like. 18 and a half K. Yeah. Okay. That's fair. Um, if you're over, if you're over 30, then you probably can't hear over like, like 16 or 17, 16 or 17. I'm still hitting yeah. 18 K on my hearing <laughs> tests. I, I'm still nailing it. Surprisingly. Anyways, the, the yeah, last one I did, it I, I had 19. So I was pretty proud of 19. The good. last time that's I did. Yeah. Like 16 or 17. It's just all gone. <laughs> but, but like, <laughs> can't even old mix guy. anymore. <laughs> but like it, yeah. Go on. But like, even though, even though, Ben, you know, your, your range of human hearing may not be, you know, my above dog 16 K. Yeah. Your, your dog hearing, you know, um, 
you can still hear things that Joe and I can't because you have more experience. Right. You have you have those refined tastes for audio. But it's also the there's you can feel it too. Like I've yeah. done I do tests in some labs with the students about that. And I'm I go up to sixteen or and seventeen and I'm just like, I can't hear it, but I can turn it on and off and I can feel it even right. though they can hear it coming off. And and that's the thing you're hearing is more than just, you know, it's the vibration of the bones in your, in your head and your body and stuff. Your jaw. Yeah. There's yeah. so much stuff, but that is, we've just gone totally off topic. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> cool, con- cool conversation though. <laughs> it's like, very cool. Headroom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like, what but yeah, I think we should probably get, I mean, it, yeah, we should probably get past. I mean, I, one last thing about the video thing First of all, we don't want to knock the especially high-end video and colorist, but it, it's it's true because in audio you notice how do we describe audio? Audio is like the hardest terms. sense to describe, right? And like Warm, we all just dark. Yeah, we we use yeah. like flavors and tastes and visual things to describe audio. So it's really one of the least tangible, you know, of our senses. Um, because it's so hard to describe because it's just happening. But like video is like, it's much easier for us to describe and because we've seen it, you know, and, and touch and, and taste. But sound is really tough um, to describe. I think, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to get into it. Okay. I have theories on that. Boy. But anyways, <laughs> let's let's move on. M- move on to more like mix yeah, down. You know, mix down. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about headroom. I think we've gotten that really good. Yeah. But just mixing in general and mix down. So the main point of it is we want to, like like Brian was saying at the beginning, you got multiple tracks and we're mixing it down to two tracks or one track for mono, you know, or, or six tracks for, you know, or 10 tracks or there's a million different surround sound formats and oh, um, that you can send it. But those are all deliverable formats. So it's got to be, you can't give somebody a multi-track and be like, well, pull this up on your DAW. Right. And listen to my mix, you know, it's like, no, you got to mix it down to like a stereo file or mono or multi-track file, like surround sound format so they can listen to it the way you intended it. I mean, but, I use something similar to that in live. It's not the same, but like I'll mix things down to like DCAs or in VCAs is the original term. VCA stands for voltage controlled. Um, I can't remember what the A stands for. Amplifier. Whatever. Or amplification amplifier. yeah voltage amplifier, control yeah. amplifier and then dc is a digital digitally controlled amplifier if you haven't heard this term before it's an analog adage it's voltage controls volume um and vca is basically controlled like a group so if you're in a DAW and then you go like turn it into a group the, like your whole drum set you now when you increase that vca you increase the whole volume of that group of the drum set almost as if you it was one track and you increase the volume of it you don't put things yeah. out of balance in that regard. The, the main point is that it's, that. yeah, that it's not, you're not changing, moving the fader. And that's why it's a VCA or DCA because it's like controlling the output gain without moving, physically moving the fader. Well, live, you always control the output yeah. gain. Well, and, yeah. And going, going back to live, you, even after doing that, you're still doing a mix down because you're right. going to your, Faster. You know, your front you're, of yeah, you're going, you're going to your front of house, your stereo left, right. I mean, you may like do an aux sub or um, oh, some I have fills much and stuff, more complicated DSP but... than just an aux sub. <laughs> Thank you very much. Or a center, you know, you might be left, center, right, right. Yeah, delay of... towers, delays. Come on, people. You... Yeah. So, and that, but... and that that goes to you know summing. Where yeah. It's basically just adding all those tracks or bringing them down into. A deliverable format yeah but yeah in general i mean it really is like you know a mixing bowl of a bunch of stuff that you throw in there and mix it all together and like they have the sum sign you know that that what is it sigma the e sort of thing yeah that's the yeah, sure. the, the sign for summing and a lot of most mixers you know a lot of the digital audio workstations will have that sign um and it is it's like it's summing everything together. It's combining everything together. And there's electrical things that are happening on analog mixers. And and summing is this whole other debate and topic because there's analog summing, there's digital summing. Every mixer that's in um, a digital mixer, an analog mixer, or a digital audio workstation mixer has its own way 
its own yes. algorithms or mechanical, you know, electronic processes of combining all that stuff together. And it does change how those sounds all go together. And that's why there are analog summing boxes. And that's why people prefer different DAWs over each other and different mixers. Right. Not that yeah. one is better or worse than others, but they're just different. different uh, like, well, well the, yeah. the analog summing box, that's an interesting discussion, but like just to kind of give some history of how that came about. Um, like, there was some, you know, it was after the transition to, to digital that some engineers were complaining about, you know, missing something. They were missing, you know, they, they felt like they're, they're missing a vibe that they got from like their, their consoles. And so this one really, really smart person like, okay. And came out with like a two U rack box that all it would do was take in 16 channels and then compile that into two outputs. Um, well, and because a lot of those mixers were literally running their DAWs through the console and putting all the faders at unity. Yeah. They were using their console as a summing box. And so this, yeah, they, they, they created a so box he, to do it. He created the box to do it and then delivered it and was like, here you go. And then and history was, was the made. First, yeah. There was the first dedicated summing mixer box. <laughs> yeah. And there's all kinds of, I mean, and, and it's one of those things that there are some really great engineers that are like, um, all that's doing is adding noise and I'd prefer to just sum digitally and get a cleaner sound and other ones that are like, I like that vibe and the noise. So it's not like everything, not like it has to be done that way, but it's just different. Yeah. The main point yeah. is that it's different. Yeah. And there's a lot of different flavors. Like, remember that these things are flavors at this point. Like as long as you're within like a reasonable balance and those other things and dynamic mix, I'm really glossing over that. As long as you're within the bounds of like acceptable technic technique experience and all those things, those things start to become flavor, honestly. Like like some people prefer to have cleaner mixes. Some people prefer to have dirtier mixes. I mean, I had a friend of mine, like we asked this at work one day. I was like, yo, um, if you were mixing in a studio, how would how would you set up your studio? And he's like, let it bleed. That was his answer. He's like, I want every mic hearing every mic. I want it to be a wall of sound. <laughs> those are, those are terms in the industry that people will use. And that's what he yeah. liked. That was his style. That's not a bad thing. He's not no. failing as a mix engineer, especially if he can turn out a really good sounding mix yeah. with that technique. That's not bad. That's just a method. That's his flavor. That's what he likes. That's his taste. And as long as things are reasonably balanced, reasonably dynamic and not overdone on any of those things, he's pro he's a great mix engineer. Like I've heard him mix live and stuff and he does a great job. So like those things kind of become like the analog summing and stuff like, well, I like that tube yeah. once. I'm like, well, I like the crystal cream digital feel, you know, like whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, and it, 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 it comes down to the whole principle of, you know, if it sounds good, it is good. Mm -hmm. you know, mix good. Mix good. I didn't even. That's our catchphrase. No, that's that's that. officially. I have decided that's the catchphrase. No. Mix, Mix good. good. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. It's okay. He'll fix it in post. So okay. So let's sum up. Pun intended. Right. So headroom and summing, like the big thing is to make sure you have headroom in your mix. It's, it makes a big deal, even if it doesn't sound like it's distorting. Your digital audio workstation might be limiting it for you. It might be you know, fooling you, the distortion that happens as soon as you start distorting your master fader can be very subtle distortion that really just takes away clarity. Doesn't like sound like that's, I think that's a big mistake. It'll still for, sound like a mix. Yeah. And you might people, not even recognize it because you might not have noticed or like keyed into it yet, but like pay attention to that, that clarity and like yeah. the, the separation. And, you know, yeah. Cause yeah. all distortion yeah. doesn't sound like, you know, like Revol <laughs> revolution yeah. fuzz, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and distortion can sometimes be used effectively. We've talked about that in the past, but this is not that distortion. That is a very different type of Yeah, when it, it's going to be really subtle and start like just taking away the clarity. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think overall it's like, make sure there's always some room on that master fader. And even if your final mix has a couple dB of headroom, you know, that's not a big deal. Like it can be you can bump that up in the mastering phase. It's not a right, like have to be point. 
of the mastery yeah. phase. You don't have to be, I mean, but don't like have like 20 decibels of headroom on your mix, you know? <laughs> it's just all empty. Yeah. That's bad, especially when we talk about healthy levels. So yeah. a healthy level on your mix down is to be, you know, no more than like 6 dB. You know, your peak is is no negative no 60. less than 6 dB, negative 6 dB. You know, your but, peak should hit at negative 6 dBFS on your master. That's what he's trying to say. Yeah, no lower than that. No more than negative 6. But yeah, like negative 3, or you can even be up there to negative 0.5 or negative 1 or something like that. Um, you know, that's all fine. But just don't be like positive. Right. One. Positive twenty three. Yeah. No, yeah. don't be positive. Don't be like. Yeah, don't be positive. 20. Only negativity. As a live sound engineer, that's the only thing you need. Negativity. <laughs> don't listen to anything anyone else has to say. Feedback is your enemy. All <laughs> feedback. Anyone giving you feedback, lies. Any any feedback on the stage, that's incompetence. <laughs> be good. Mix good. <laughs> I don't want to hear this crap. <laughs> negativity. Never boost. Only cut. Remove. Remo okay. Mix good. So, mix good. <laughs> Go mix forth good. and mix good. Good luck, don't suck. Guys with no lives, signing out. Yeah.